in society, these individuals are labeled barbaric, savage, and even downright demonic. But in the underground world, they're held at the highest standard, the upper echelons of the streets. These are the 10 most notorious steppers. Blizz Micho is a Gorilla Stone blood that's been trying to get into the music industry following the success of Gorilla Stone OG, casting over two times. He would go on to authenticate his street raps by putting in work in a short period of time. His first recorded hit was on April of 2020, when he spotted a rival member walking up Sheffield Avenue. Micho was recorded running up and from about three yards away, firing twice, striking his thighs and wrist. As the enemy turned around, Blaze stared into his eyes before putting one more in his chest. His following hit took place on May 16th, when Blizz pulled up four blocks away from a gangster disciple housing project, looking for any GD he could find. When he did, he chased them outside where he let off one round hitting his target. Unbeknownst to Blizz, a man witnessed the entire thing and reported everything to authorities. But after only two hours, the witness oddly retracted his statement, leaving police no choice but to set him free. Sadly, he threw away his freedom just a couple months later. Like most young men in Brooklyn, Rosh had to pick sides in a dangerous East Flatbush neighborhood in order to legitimize his street presence. He joined one of the most active sets in New York, the G-Stone 90 Crips. Their main oppositions are the BMWs after they took out their GS9 leader in 2011. Rasha's most public act of revenge happened alongside Bobby Shmurda. On January of 2015, Raj and Bobby spotted multiple BMWs standing in front of the County Supreme Court building. Not caring that it was broad daylight, Raj and Bobby dumped on them in front of multiple witnesses. On the following month, Rasha continued by kicking in the door of a bodega on Clarkson Ave, then spraying every BMW member inside. Again, Rasha ran off unscathed. He would repeat these hits cross country, getting oppositions in Miami and even piercing random bystanders by mistake. By the end of 2014, GS9 was dominating everything, from the streets to the music industry. This is when the feds took it upon themselves to dismantle the entire organization. Queso became a loose cannon after Rivals took out his brother, Willie Addison. So on February 19th, he drove to Rival territory to even the score. As Julio Fulio's little brother Bibby was staring at his phone, Queso quietly ran up and let off over a dozen rounds. As Bibby struggled to cover his face, Queso stood over him and emptied out the rest of his 30 round drum. In his demented mind, this wasn't enough, so he continued on January 15th. After getting the location on Lil Buck, aka the rapper who dissed his brother, he gathered up two of his best point guards and pulled up to the shopping center he was at. At 11 a.m., a man witnessed Queso chopping Lil Buck down with over 40 rounds. After fleeing the scene, Queso drove to a nail salon where he openly mocked Lil Buck while getting a pedicure. Today, Queso is awaiting trial after his own father agreed to testify. Lil Wet is from a Chicago neighborhood so horrific police labeled it Terror Town. The 2x4 block radius is home to the Black Mob as well as the notorious NLMB set that's comprised of over 4 gangs put together. The fact that these people are so intertwined but at the same time at war with each other caused one of the messiest summers in Chicago history. With over 90 days of consecutive gunplay, everyone from pets to bystanders were getting caught in the chaos. Due to Lil Wet's involvement, there would be numerous failed attempts on his life. Eventually, Black Mob got so desperate that they took out his father in frustration. As soon as Lil Wet got the news, he strapped up and went out looking for war. At 3 p.m. the following day, he spotted his targets inside of a fish and chicken spot. Kicking the door wide open, he began eliminating them one by one. It wouldn't take long before detectives made the connection between this and his father's incident. So on April of 2017, he was charged with quadruple bodies. Luckily for him, after three years of trial, his entire case was dismissed due to witnesses refusing to cooperate.
this Chicago native was a sweet innocent girl who attended charter school for the majority of her life. It wasn't until the loss of her best friend in 2012 that her world turned upside down. Since then, she clayed up with the gangster disciples and at 14 she earned her first stripe. In August of 2011, she spotted O.D. Perry riding a bike from a corner store back to Parkway Gardens. As he rode through 64th and King Drive, she let off two rounds, striking O.D. in the left side. Witnesses said they seen him fall off his bike and try to run away. That's when she let off ten more. This time, he would never get back up. The following day, she posted a selfie holding the revolver she took from O.D., thus creating O-Block. As time went on, she became more and more deranged. On April of 2014, Chief Keef's cousin Mario Hess was in Chicago celebrating his brand new record deal. At 9.45 p.m., she spotted him sitting at a stop sign talking to some women. Without hesitation, K.I. Cheese graded his car with over 24 holes. Ironically, she met the same fate two days later. As a preteen, D Rose had already solidified himself as one of the top gangsters in his city, and by 13, he caught his first body. In 2011, opposition Dale Fisher was walking back from a ceasefire event. As he made his way back to 63rd and St. Lawrence, D Rose drifted the corner, dumping lead with one hand and steering the wheel with the other, officially earning his first stripe. His next stunt was after Tuka's brother Lil Mark dropped one of the most disrespectful songs ever recorded. In his rendition of No Competition, Lil Mark name drops all of D Rose's fallen friends. Exactly three days later, D Rose took him out the exact same way Tuka got dropped, standing at a bus stop. Crazy enough, he drove back to the scene just minutes later to show off his work on Instagram Live. One of King Vaughn's first acts of aggression was in 2012. On a brisk October afternoon, Modell and his cousin were walking down the 63rd block of South Rhodes Avenue. That's when Vaughn jumped out a moving vehicle and began letting off. As the cousin got on his knees to shield Modell, Vaughn stood over them both and let off five more. Two years after that, he caught his most infamous body and avenged his fallen friend, O.D. Perry. On April of 2014, Vaughn was leaving his parole officer making his way back home. Before entering Parkway Gardens, he recognized K.I. playing dice on his corner. As she bent over to roll the dice, Vaughn walked up and let off seven times. Attempting to stumble away, Vaughn stopped her and whispered something in her ear before putting two more directly in her jaw, officially getting back for the entire Parkway Gardens. The bizarre thing about Melly is that he went from being a high school varsity basketball player to a psychopath overnight. On September of 2008, his friend Zico Walker was slaughtered in a McDonald's parking lot. This hit Melly hard because he was trying to follow in his footsteps and get a scholarship to play ball. So the next day, he quit the team and joined the 051 Young Money Renegades. By 2014, Melly's name rang bells after his first attack on the infamous OTF family. Lil Durk's cousin Nooski was in Chicago two days after signing his first record deal. At 3.20 p.m., he was sitting in his car at the Village Square Mall waiting for his girlfriend to come out. That's when Melly creeped up and fired non-stop until Nooski hit the gas pedal colliding into the store. Melly's next hit on OTF was on March of 2015, when Dirk's manager Chino Dollars drove to a food spot on Stony Island Nav. As he ate his cheeseburger inside of his car, Melly casually stuck his arm in and began letting off. After this, Dirk had no choice but to put money on his head. So on a late Chicago night, Melly attended a gang-infested house party. That's where someone recorded Nathaniel Hicks ripping into Melly in a packed living room. Skinny Me is a demonic figure born and raised in North Philadelphia. Living on 29th and Jefferson, he helped establish the Body Snatchers, a Philly gang that's comprised of only elite scorers. His most notorious hit was when him and his co-defendant caught a body, were indicted, found guilty, and still beat the case. After the driver on the mission testified on both of them, the judge handed down a guilty verdict, but by the grace of God, his lawyer found a loophole in the case and took it to the third federal circuit. It turns out that the prosecutors allowed the informant to testify behind closed doors, not allowing the defendants to cross-examine him, thus making the entire case invalid, putting Skinny back in the streets. 
Soon afterwards, he was recruited to A.R. Abs OBH Mafia, who operated what the New York Times labeled the largest open-air dope market on the East Coast. In hopes of legitimizing the crew, Skinny Me picked up a microphone and began dropping music. Unfortunately, he was picked up by U.S. Marshals after being on the run for another body. Coming from a long line of gangster royalty, Les would follow in his grandfather's footsteps by dominating the majority of the east and south side of Chicago at the age of 12. In the early 2000s, GD hoods were mostly groups that hustled together and threw house parties, with the most serious beefs ending in fist fights. That changed in 2005 when Les sparked one of the first wars between multiple GD sets. On a cold December night, the top hustlers, ABM, were throwing one of their biggest house parties ever and had invited only certain hoods. When Lester showed up to party, a man he considered a good friend blocked the doorway and told him he wasn't invited. Realizing that alliances were being built, Lester came back at 12 a.m. with a pocket rocket and blew the face off the guy who kicked him out, aka Jarvis Smith. The back and forth that came afterwards resulted in Lester getting blasted directly in the left eye. With a less than 5% chance of survival, Les managed to walk away with only vision loss. Ultimately, what cemented him as a 5-star general was for his most infamous act of valor. When him and his gang got indicted in 2009, Lester stood up and took all the charges in order for his young soldiers to continue the war. He was sentenced to 24 years in prison.